Our guest today is Dr. Heiko Hoffman. At the time of this interview, Dr. Hoffman was manager of the Autonomous Intelligence Department within the Information and System Sciences Laboratory of HRL Laboratories, known here as ISSL. How is artificial intelligence different from autonomous intelligence? Artificial intelligence, yeah, there's a lot of confusion about the term artificial intelligence, because strictly speaking, it doesn't even exist. It may be artificial, but it's not intelligent. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's commonly understood, artificial intelligence as, in, in these days, as, as the field of, of machine learning, which boils down to learning some structure patterns into lots of amount, into big amounts of data. And so we find, for example, in a big collection of photographs, we find a very specific signature, for example, of a cat, and it allows us to recognize a cat. And those methods that allow us to do the training without um, any human interference uh, are, are the field of machine learning, and that's commonly understood at, as artificial intelligence uh, these days. And this and has been obviously used in a broad area of, uh, of applications. Uh, whenever you have masses of data and there's some structure in the data, for example, some regularities in time or regularities in space, having enough of the data, you can find the structure in the data. And, and that's useful for many different applications, for example, to defeat credit card fraud or finding uh, intrusions in the internet, and or generally finding interesting patterns in satellite imagery or in, in space images. What I found, many people um, don't really um, understand what is really the limitations of artificial intelligence. Since, and that's partly unfortunate because uh, due, due to the name, uh, artificial intelligence, which, you know, as I mentioned, it doesn't even exist. Right. And it's it's not that we have anything that closely resembles human intelligence. We have, um, yeah, as I mentioned, it's, it's a, a pattern recognition machine that's maybe built based on some of the insights we gain from understanding human, the brain, um, but it's still very different from human intelligence. It's yeah, it's, it's not a competition at all right, to us humans. It's, I see it as, as, as a, a tool right, that can complement what we do. Um, but because it's the way it's framed, it's often seen as something artificially intelligent, as a potential um, competition to the human mind. And, and it's been popularized in things like, for example, the, the first AI that beat the best human chess player the first AI that beat the best human Go player, and so on. But, but those are very, very, very specific tasks um, that are still very limited in terms of the, the, the variety or complexity compared to anything in the real world task. Uh, very, very simple tasks like um, finding a chair in the room and sitting down on a chair is still fairly difficult for a robot to do. Mm. How is uh, artificial intelligence different from autonomous intelligence? Yeah, we, we are still very good at anything that involves dexterity, manipulating things, um, uh, anything involving human-human interaction. Obviously, we are vastly superior. We have empathy. And anything requiring like big picture thinking, having like an overview of many things, or so getting the, the essence, for example, reading an article, understanding the essence of the article is very hard uh, for a machine system. Even for relatively simple translation, the Google translation system, while often works very impressively across tons of languages, it doesn't understand at all the meaning of a sentence. It's just through pattern recognition, pattern repetition, and knowing the patterns of language learned through many, many data, um, through a lot of data, it's, it's just based on this you know, brute force way learned to translate without even trans understanding a single word of it. 
And for that reason, also obviously, sometimes those, those machine systems make mistakes that are rather comical to yes. humans. <laughs> Are we teaching machines to imitate humans right now? Imitation is 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 not the main thing. Well, to some extent, we can ex we can teach a robot to imitate us, mm -hmm. just imitating our movements. Um, but it's um, yeah, it has certain applications, but it's probably not the main thing. Machine learning itself is not so much about imitation of humans. It's more, as I mentioned, more about uh, at least today, it's more about finding patterns, structure in data. Mm. Um, if you have like millions of data points, can I find some which could be totally unknown structure to us humans even at this point? But I could ask, I can use a machine to figure out in those millions of images to figure out some structure that at the end can map onto a certain class of images. For example, we can use it to recognize faces. It's not in any form uh, an imitation of what the human would do. It's, it's, it's yeah. It's it's really complementary because it's it's at this point it also works very differently from how the human brain is doing. It does things very well, like finding structure and, and tons of data. We we have we don't have the capacity to process. Uh, at the same time, presenting. The, the same machine, a single sentence, it has no clue what the, the meaning of the sentence is. Right. So it's, it's really different from, from yeah. human intelligence. You've done uh, work in autonomous intelligence. What is the goal there? Uh, autonomous intelligence, well, it's... It, the idea is you have... Uh, that's, that's in the context of autonomous systems of some autonomous platforms. Let's say, for example, a robot in the field. Um, you you want the machine to to on its own to to figure out how, how to operate in its environment, to, to figure out basically the um, the, the structure of its environment, um, learn based on that structure, and and then learn on its own how how to navigate in a potentially new environment, how to overcome obstacles in this new environment. So it will be um, a system that, that is learning while in operation, and, and it, it can deal with events that are un unforeseeable. But the, the attractive thing is, from the human engineering perspective, I'm, it's very hard to foresee all possible things that can go wrong if I put a robotic platform in, on, on some place on, on Earth, and, and and more likely than not, right? Some, some things happen to turn out differently, but the uh, the vision is that th this machine will adapt locally, figure out based on possibly based on its own actions and and the difference from the the outcome of the actions versus the predictions. So once a machine has some learning capability, it has some capability. To, to predict what will be, or at least it could be done this way, to predict what will be the outcome of its actions, what it's doing. And, and then it could find, for example, a discrepancy between its predictions and the actual sensor input. The world changed suddenly different. Something is different from my own expectations. And, and you could use this as a training signal or a signal to teach the robot to, to choose a certain behavior. Does this apply to self-driving cars? The traditional approach for, for self-driving cars, obviously, it's it's a very you now very big field. Um, a lot of things are going on in self-driving cars, and it's become so big, I don't have the full overview of the whole field anymore. And so, yeah, so so it's hard, hard to, to to give you any overview or definite statement on, on this field. But um, let's say the more traditional uh, approach is that they d design rules. Uh, of engagement to deal with certain um, sensor inputs for certain uh, situations, let's say the intersection, there's, there's a left turn and then there's a certain traffic signs are out there, there's obstacles here and there. Um, for, for a certain arrangement, we can define what are the rules, what the car should do. Right? And, and, and the traditional way is the more the, the, the rule-based approach. And, it, and it's possibly will um, 
go in, in, into a direction where it's, there, there's more learning on the field or on the road and then more uh, adaptation to what's around the car. Can we program machines to protect humans or be moral by just teaching them to imitate our morals? Yeah, I like Asimov's three rules of robotics. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those, those are fun. And they're particularly fun from the perspective of the, they're in a way totally nonsensical because they cannot be engineered. Uh, but, but if you take them literal, then you have all kind of interesting deductions and conclusions in that what Asimov uh, did in his work, which is very entertaining. <laughs> if, if you would really take them as, as rules, I think that, that was the, uh, the fun part about this work. But, but it, yeah, seriously, for if you really try to engineer those um, as, like, as, as fundamental rules, it would be very hard. Because um, um, you cannot just as, as, a, as a law of physics tell a machine you're never going to harm a, a robot because it's because of its complexity you cannot rule out there's some technical error or some code is so complex right even like, like if you look at the any autonomous car or any iPhone any sufficiently complex machine no single human really understands what's going on in, in the entire machine there's always unexpected technical difficulties. And it will be very hard to completely rule out no accident could happen, not, not, at least not with 100% certainty. Mm -hmm. We can go towards close to 0% failure, but not 100% certainty in, if we really deal with a complex system embedded in a complex world. So, so from that angle, we cannot strictly say, um, yeah, d don't cause any harm to humans. To a machine, we can just program it. We, we can certainly program it from the way of, if there in, in some of the rules the robot goes through in, in its thinking, let's say in a certain situation, right? We can certainly design it in a way um, to avoid harm to humans. Right? But it's, um, it's it wouldn't be a strict physics law, and I think that that was the the fun part about Asimov, uh, three law of robotics. That yeah, if. If this would, could, could be really done, right? That's that's the science fiction fantasy. Then you have all sorts of interesting conclusions. When you began uh, in robotics research, did you have any specific goals in mind or areas that you wanted to explore? Um, the, the interesting thing, uh, yeah, for I had a long fascination with automation in general. Um, since I was a, a, a small boy um, uh, growing up in in Germany and. Uh, and I was fascinated by seeing just in, in manufacturing, for example, the, the whole automation process. We happen to have a, a, a watch manufacturer in town. It was fairly small, but it was nationally known uh, watch company. And then they produced a, a little alarm clock, for example. And once as a kid, I was about 10 years old. I, I got to see the, the production line and it was totally automated. It, it was, didn't use robots in the way we think about robots. Right? We usually think about a robot as something that has like six degrees of freedom, like an arm, can move things flexible at different locations on the table, for example. But it's more like traditional automation, like very much in, in engineered. And, but it, and it's, it works so seamlessly, right? and it works so beautifully, all on its own. Right? And, it, and it can be uh, also interfaced with a computer, and, and like, you can write the uh, routes on the computer and to, to, to to, to make it move in a certain way. And so I had, as, uh, in, in my childhood, I had a fascination with automation and then using co a computer to, to code programs, to automate all these processes. So, so that was my main driving force going into robotics. Um, but I also had a, a, a second interest, which was uh, understanding the human mind. And there was also goes way back into my early childhood, just figuring out right how, what what does makes us tick, what makes us work, what is the whole mystery about consciousness? How does the experience feel like the way it does? How can you explain all this? And and ultimately, I felt already as as a child, it, it's this 
curiosity and this drive to figure out our own brain, this sort of makes us different from other animal species. And and so yeah, if, so really to 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 live out this human potential, right? It's that this seemed to be the most exciting thing, figuring out how the human mind works, how the brain works. And so I, I was very fascinated about this and 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 it guided a lot of my my studies and and then so so at some point the, the fascination with automation and the fascination for for how the human brain works uh, combined uh, maybe, maybe at first when I when I did my PhD looking like at at that time, that was in Germany at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences. When I looked at models of perception and and how can we test uh, those models of protect, uh, perception um, in a robotic system, and because testing it in a robotic system forces us to really think through what is really needed to make this happen, and you can actually test it, and only if we build it, then we really understand it. And and also, then continuing to uh, to my work at HL, yeah, it, it sort of was very suitable. Often this this combination, um, yeah, I found many opportunities. So uh, along the line of um, understanding more how the human brain works and combining this with with robotics, are human thought and perception structurally dependent? Um, if you think about perception, right, perception is more than seeing. Uh, let's say if you define seeing is more like the pure sensory input, uh, light hits the um, s certain sensory uh, s cells, excites the cells, and so 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 it's more like like a, like a camera setup. But a camera doesn't perceive anything. So we go from seeing to perceiving if we actually understand what is in the scene. And, and there's still a big mystery. Right? We don't we don't have the the answer yet. I, I'm hoping we can get closer to it. Um, but it, but it's still a big mystery. The, the approach I, I was following at that time, and it already started about 20 years ago, um, is looking at perception from the following angle. So um, and and this is uh, somewhat. A more unconventional approach. It's it's bringing in in the action into perception. So it's we we don't just purely perceive by taking the sensor input onto the retina, mapping onto the visual cortex, and just processing it. Instead, we gain perception by uh, manipulating things um, and understanding if I turn something, let's say maybe a, a wheel, right. It was also fascinating when my son was like one year old, for example, observing him playing with toys and wheels and things. And then let's say at this age, you play with a wheel, you turn a wheel actively. You get a sense of this rotation of my, my hand or of my arm and how that is linked to my sensory input. I, I learned this relationship. I learned to predict on the one hand how does the sensor, how does the motor command change the sensor input? On, on the other hand, I, I, when I now analyze the visual scene, I bring in this link, right? I, I saw some, some sensor input and that, that matches with me rotating. And it was the, the hypothesis I was following at that time, that this is very central to the actual uh, action of of per perception itself, that you have this strong link with, a, in some way, also with a simulation of my actions. That I link the sensor input with my simulation of, of turning the wheel. And this way, I actually understand what I'm seeing is something that is round, it can be turned. Otherwise, if I just look at it abstractly, there's no real meaning in, in in, in the sensor input of, of a wheel, for example, right? Why would a wheel feel different from, from a shoe, from a, <laughs> any, any kind of object, right? It's just, just the excitation of, 
of neurons. Why, why would it be any different? But but it is it is this link with at the same time the the, the motor experience that make, makes this this, this real special or makes this object special. So I think it's very central to the act of perception. How has the basic idea of AI changed over your career? If you look at really long term, there have been obviously many changes and it, it went through various waves of, of popularity as well. Also waves in funding, <laughs> which came with the popularity. Uh, yeah, recently it has been uh, more popular over the last 10 years or so. Um, but there were, there were times, um, for example, when I, uh, let's say towards the end of my PhD, like, like 2004, um, neural networks were very unpopular uh, at that time. And, and people were looking more at um, statistical machine learning. Uh, I mean, e even in the machine learning community, neural networks were unpopular. It, it was only more recently, like starting around 2012, with a demonstration that if if you use those neural network structures and then you layer them up and you make them very deep and you feed them millions of images and you train it with the, with the computers at that time, you can already do that. And then you can actually do some impressive things. And then the neural networks became much more popular. Ten years before that, one had, yeah, we didn't have the computation power, also we didn't have the suitable um, uh, data sets were not readily available. And 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 yeah, for for that reason, it was uh, yeah, the, the field was kind of uh, struggling in that sense. So yeah, there was so during the last uh, let's say fifteen years, th there was quite a change in. In, in terms of one and how neural networks were, were perceived and then also used. And then, and then once it was demonstrated, like 2012 or so, um, that you could do interesting things. And, and it got over the next following years better and better at doing it. And then people got the idea like, oh, there's a lot of exciting applications I could do. It was applied to many, many, many different things eventually created enough momentum that, that this field uh, really took off and the holy eye field. But, but as, as it typically happens, since there, there's momentum, the field is taking off, there's then expectations that are m much higher than justified. And so it was obviously there was a lot of hype also, probably still is, and in, in, the, in that field. And, and also coming back to the what we talked about earlier, this discrepancy between what what is um, known as AI uh, can do and what it can really do, um, there's still in uh, my guess is in, in most people's mind that there's quite a, a big uh, discrepancy between what you think it can do and what it actually can do, and. And that's, yeah, finally, this discrepancy is sort of reinforced that the, the people working in the area who know more about what it can actually do probably are not as, as open as you would like about the limitations because maybe they, they need funding or there's <laughs> other constraints. It's, it's some, at some point or, or sometimes quite embarrassing to see how, how poorly those methods are, are doing. And on the other hand, you see those very high expectations about what could, what people think it really is it's doing, or, or what might it be doing. Have there ever been times when a robot or an AI system you were working on did something that uh, you didn't know it could do? Yeah, let's say working with robotics, it's to. It, it didn't surprise me in a way that it could suddenly do something you wouldn't expect it could do because you, you have a vision of an automation system or a robotic system, what it will accomplish. And before it actually does it, you already have the vision mentally, at least mentally in my mind, it was already running in a simulation, how everything would work, right? And then th there may be surprises along the way that it's it doesn't work as well <laughs> <laughs> as you think or there's a certain unexpected errors in the system. 
But yeah, since, since it's all, um, and I think that that's key to the engineering discipline, if you want to create some complex machinery, before you actually create it, there's the vision about how it will work. What could be, can be a surprise if you look at um, uh, maybe a longer time horizon, and if you imagine certain capabilities or certain things what, what the robot system could do, um, it, it may be down the line um, uh, surprised you in a way it, it worked much better than expected. Because right? it can be, especially on the longer time horizon, um, we, we, we tend to underestimate the, the many things that can happen. Mm -hmm. While in the shorter time horizon, we maybe overestimate the, the things we could accomplish. So that, that seems to be very typical. So, so I, I could imagine uh, a, a, a surprise in, in this way. Mm -hmm. though, though overall, um, our advancement in robotics has been uh, a lot slower than I expected, let's say, 20 years ago. I would have expected, or maybe even 10 years ago, I would have expected we would be uh, a lot more advanced in our robotics uh, technologies today, and it's somewhat, uh, yeah, somewhat shocking or somewhat um, disappointing that there hasn't been more uh, advances in the robotics field itself. I, I recently looked at some robotic videos, and I was thinking they might as well have been like ten years ago. Mm. There's there's no real um, uh, apparent advancements, or no really obvious. Obviously, there has been some advan advances in certain areas. Certain sensors get a lot better. But I think overall, as a field, we, I think we didn't, in, 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 th in those fields, in robotics, but we didn't uh, advance that far. And, and especially if you compare it with the, the, um, the software development, if you think about the, the smartphone, re smartphone revolution or anything related with the internet, a, a lot of advances have been made in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And in relative to that is is a rather very modest advance in robotics. Is is this the type of field where you start with one goal and end up with something different? Yeah, that can happen. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's always um, I, I feel ben, be, uh, beneficial to to be open minded about the the, the potential outcome of, of a project because there can be surprises along the way and then unforeseen opportunities. Mm -hmm. if, if we constrain it too much, maybe focus too much on a very specific application in, in the beginning, and while at some point it can be helpful in terms of the, the, the design and the direction, the focus, um, it's, it's, it, it might um, prevent us from, from uh, seeing another opportunity on the way, which happened to be a better um, uh, yeah, a, a better working system. What are uh, goals for the future of AI? Where is it going? So, so, so my 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 vision for the machine intelligence uh, field is is sort of what is the, the the next big tool? So I talked about the tool of we have something that's very good at finding a pattern structure in. Uh, in, in lots of data points. but so, so starting from that, we have that tool, which is nice. So what is the, the next tool? And I think the next tool we need is, is something that um, creates a model a hypothesis about the, the data. Mm -hmm. so, so imagine we have um, hundreds of journal articles scientific articles. For, for a human, it's very hard to uh, wrap your mind around the, the content of, of one article and then even a hundred articles and to get the essence of the whole body of work. It's, we, we, we can do it better than anything else. We can do it better than any machine, but it's still, it's, it's a very hard, hard thing. And, and what we, and, and, it's, and it's getting harder with more and more things getting published. There's more and more those data points. And I think we reached the point where we need a tool 
that we that can create a hypothesis or model, what is the eth essence in, for example, in these hundred articles? And then and I could potentially scale it to thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand articles. What is the overall the essence in all those hundred thousand articles? What is the model, the hypothesis that is supported by all these points of evidence? I think this this will be a tool of tremendous value. The reason why I think we are at the point where where we need to develop this tool is we now reached, uh, especially in the, it's especially apparent in the sciences, the the point we we do more and more have more and more specializations of fields. Um, even though more more people work on the sciences, but there's the, each individual field get more and more specialized. So we have more and more smaller groups of of experts, more and more smaller fields, and and it, and what is lacking is like the big, more the big picture, right? bringing all those small fields together again, mm -hmm. and and it is well known right in the let's say a um, hundred years ago there were a lot more people who are Experts in many, in biology and physics, in many different disciplines, right? Mm -hmm. uh, those uh, that became a lot uh, is, is a lot rarer these days, and because we have this in, intense specialization, and then part of that is it's just it's just uh, we don't do it on purpose. I think <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's just the challenge of dealing with all those many different points of of information and bringing it all together. And, and for that reason, I think, for us to advance as a human species, we, we need this tool that helps us to bring everything together. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that also relates to what I mentioned earlier, my dissatisfaction with, with robotics in the field. It's, yeah, because you deal with a very complex uh, system, complex machinery and complex, it has so many elements, right? And it's just, it's just very hard with our human capacity, and and and, and it, it is sort of one thing that would benefit from a bigger integration of things, and and so so having the tool allows us to build this this model. You may th think about it as a model or a hypothesis that you, that you discover, uh, and 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 if the machine, even though the discovery process will be at some point a mystery, right? If the machine is doing it. It might be a mystery how it's, it's doing it because it's doing it based on hundred thousand papers. It somehow extracts that information, right? But but once it it does extract this model, this hypothesis, it could communicate it to us in relatively simple terms. Same way, if you work on a very hard uh, scientific physics problem and you a mathemat a mathematics problem, and you, if you figure out the solution, finding the solution is very very hard. But communicating the solution is often a lot easier. And, and that's how I envision th th those kind of tools will be used. Do you think the coming age of quantum computation will help you get there? I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't have um, a deep knowledge of the whole quantum compu computation field. Um, it's, it's certainly beneficial for a certain type of computation. Um, I know large, but, large, massive data. Yeah, and but I, I don't know yet if, if it will be relevant mm. in in this context. Like let's say for creating such kind of model, mm -hmm. maybe not. The, the guideline for creating such a machinery, such a tool that creates this model, I mentioned, uh, will be figuring out how the human brain works, mm. and how how is because because right now we are the best tool that can create such a model. Right? And so we need to learn more. How does the brain do it? Try to understand it, and then um, and then try to replicate uh, certain key aspects uh, from that. And I think the way the brain is doing it, it doesn't use uh, quantum computing. <laughs> and so, so at least uh, there's a proof of concept that it can be done uh, without quantum quantum computing. Now, if you want to scale it up. To, to millions of like let's say millions of articles and do we need quantum computing? I, I don't know. Um, maybe it plays a role, maybe not. So this is a another fun question. Do we need to fear AI or fear robots taking over? I, I don't think we need to fear, but it's it's always good to be 
um, knowledgeable about the field to know what's going on. You, you don't want to blindly use a tool because any tool can be ob obviously ob um, abused. And because there are a lot of uh, misperceptions regarding what AI actually does. And if you look at it more closely, it's we really don't need to worry about AI at this point. And also another thing regarding AI and robotics about development of new tools or developing of robots. And I had, especially in the robotics context, I had this conversation often. The, the fear that robots will take over jobs, for example. Um, and then, but, but I see it as it's, it's just a way of our continuous uh, evolution and, and, and uh, how the way we continuously evolve as a society, as humans. We, we create new tools. The new tools create new opportunities, new jobs. And, and and it naturally changes the character of a job. And and so so we, we need to adapt uh, with the changing technology, we need to adapt ourselves and then make use of those new uh, opportunities that arise. Because now once, it, for example, once we go through the change and looking back, uh, very, very few people will miss the kind of jobs we had like 100 or 200 years ago, if you think about horse carriages or on shoveling coal, um, th th there were a lot of jobs uh, no, no one really misses today. <laughs> and it will be similar going into the future. For example, at some point, no one will miss the job of, of driving a truck or driving a, a car. You will drive a car for, for fun. There will be opportunities to drive for fun somewhere. But you wouldn't want to do a, a, as a job like uh, eight hours a day sitting behind the wheel because yeah, there are more exciting things to do. And, and so yeah, we just need to be adaptable, be flexible. Mm -hmm. What are some projects that you've worked on that you're most proud of that you want to hold up and, and brag about? Um, th there were certainly a lot of projects we had, we had a lot of fun working on. Um, f for example, um, what we what we did is in in the uh, early days when I started HL, we worked on a on a program with robotic manipulation, and we had uh, a task, for example, like picking up a hand drill with a robot arm and gripper, picking up a hand drill, a hand drill made for humans with a human a button suitable for the human hand, but not necessarily for the robot hand, and so we had to pick up the hand drill, move it around, and actuate the button and drill a hole at a certain specific location. And, and that is one of those tasks where you think at the beginning, this sounds really complex I do, to realize this in a robot, right? And, and, it, it, and we actually made it work. And it just, yeah, those are examples of fun, fun moments. You could put something like that in a space station, right? Y yes, yes certain, certainly <clears throat> the, the capability to, to manipulate um, you could put in it, uh, uh, with a robot in any kind of environment you could imagine because you, you're much less restricted um, to like a, a human friendly environment. You could deploy robots on Mars for manipulations, maybe preparing a future uh, human mission or on the moon and or on maybe on, on planets that are completely hostile, like, like Venus, where you cannot send any human. There's a lot of more, more space if you don't need to engineer like a capsule where a human can survive, right? Uh, certainly we can, like remote robotics is, is a big area. You've been at HRL for over 10 years. What has HRL excelled at in this field? Yes, so HRL is very good in, in this field because of the, on one hand, we have a lot of bright people working at HL. On the other hand, it's, it's the, 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 sorry, the diversity of backgrounds we have. We have people in physics, material science, and, and bringing, and then together with the, with the computer science, bringing together all these disciplines in one location. That, that's where the real benefit is. That, that's our strength. With that in mind, what's your take on neuromorphic computers? I, I think yeah, I'm skeptical about a neuromorphic computing. And, and it's part of the problem is you, um, and this has to be seen in the context of generally 
uh, like Moore's law and the evolution of the computation right, in general, that it, it advances so or advances so so quickly, right? CPUs, or, or, or GPUs became so so quick so quickly mm -hmm. that it's very hard for something come up with a specialized hardware. It takes uh, ten years to develop to do a new kind of computation. Um, you're typically better off just waiting for overall for computing to get faster. <laughs> so uh, yeah. it's it's very difficult to find applications that it really make sense. And also at that time, we really had a hard time finding good applications for the technology because yeah, it just the, the standard computing technology. It gets more energy efficient. It gets always faster year over year. And yeah, we haven't quite reached the limits yet over the last 10 years. It's the, 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 the small um, transistor units, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, incredibly right. tiny. <laughs> We're really close to the physical limit now. For that reason, it's been really hard to do with some unconventional hardware. Mm -hmm. And so, so we are actually better off thinking about new ways to do the computation in, in software we then can leverage any kind of hardware. And it's a lot easier than to, to port it into, into systems or have systems in place that already have the hardware. So the electronics are actually faster than the um, biological synapses. If you just look at the, at the brain as, as an uh, example or comparison, the, the way we do computation on, the, on a micro scale, like with synapses firing, it's not that efficient. Um, there could be you could imagine a lot more efficient computation and then on, on the small on the same length scale as let's say a neuron we can put amazing computation in a silicon chip uh -huh. and which could yeah vastly outperform anything out the neuron could do we, we still don't fully understand all the computation of a neuron to be fair there might be some surprises and there have been some suggestions there might be more than the neurons might do more than what is commonly assumed, but but I, I'm doubtful it could overcome what, what's already possible on a small, tiny, tiny chip of the same size. Right. So 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 the, the real advancement, like say, going towards creating the the model, the tool, the, the tool that creates the model of of, of the world of certain uh, for certain data is figuring out what are the general computational principles th the brain is using. It, is, it must do something very smart, very clever, using this, even though it's not the, the best performing computational substrate, it can still do some, some amazing things with it, which we even don't come close with our computing power. We even don't come close simulating. So there must be some, some clever tricks in the machinery which no one understands yet that then enables the, the new advances. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you have a 17-year-old son. Where do you see this field by the time, say, he's an old man? As I mentioned, with, with, this, with this tool that can create the model, let's say, of, of a thousand or mi millions of articles, um, I think we have a shot of having this tool at our disposal. And, and that itself will create new in innovations, because it allows us to do problem solving which we are still not capable of. And that could bring um, amazing advances, maybe cure some diseases we right now don't have a handle on. And yeah, maybe at that point, um, I'm hopeful that things like cancer are a lot better understood, a lot better understood how we, how we deal with it or how to avoid it. I, I'm hopeful that human health in general is better understood and we understand better how um, we can maintain the health instead of managing disease. My, my long-term vision, we have, we have the, the tools in place that, that make all these things, uh, things happen. And, and by that time, hopefully someone will have been on Mars and <laughs> tell us stories about it. And <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful about the future that still the, 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 the most exciting things are still to come. And I'm looking forward to see it. And, uh, Hope my son, who's now yeah, 17, can experience all that and, and hopefully play a part in helping making it happen. Well, thank you, Heiko. It's been fascinating talking to you. 
Thanks, Sean. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me.